Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Gazette's In-Depth Week. Um, as part of our Iowa Ideas initiative, we are taking the time to explore key issues in Iowa. And this week, we are focusing on aging in Iowa. Um, as the number of Iowans aged 65 and older continues to grow, we wanted to spend the time to talk about critical resources that are needed for this population and what challenges industry leaders, government officials, and advocates across the state face in keeping this population safe, thriving, and happy. Um, I know that's particularly a conversation of concern coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic and still dealing with the coronavirus in some capacity. Um, and so this will be a good conversation today about long-term care, but before we get started into the panel, um, we would like to thank our sponsors and we have a brief video from our sponsors that we would like to play. Hello, I'm Kathy Good, the director of the Chris and Susie DeWolf Family Innovation Center for Aging and Dementia, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to introduce you to the DeWolf Innovation Center, a place of continuing discovery of new ways to look at aging and dementia. And all who visit will experience an environment that is friendly to older adults and those living with dementia, from the lighting, to the flooring, to the colors on the walls, the furnishings, the wayfinding, all very innovatively designed to meet the needs of the population that we serve. It will provide services uh, to home our village residents and the public, uh, services offered by the new uh, Mercy Center for Memory Health, the Family Caregiver Center, and the Mercy Clinic for Geriatric Acute Care. It will house a dementia-enabled smart apartment full of ideas to age in place at home, kiosks that demonstrate assistive technology, and a community-focused demonstration program for people living with early-stage dementia. These services have been thoughtfully created using a design thinking model that encompasses customer discovery, which leads to prototypes and ultimately to implementation. The design thinking innovation experience model is a signature of the DeWolf Innovation Center, available to be facilitated for other stakeholders and organizations. So we're very excited about the difference that we will make by thinking differently about how people age and live with dementia. And I hope you will take the opportunity to learn more about the great work happening at the DeWolf Innovation Center and join us to improve the lives of individuals in our communities. Thank you. All right, thank you to our sponsors again. Um, and thank you to all of our audience members for joining us for this conversation today. Um, before we really get started into the conversation, I would just like to encourage all of you as we are um, having this conversation and, and talking to our panelists to ask questions throughout. Um, you can put them in the Q&A box and um, I will try to get to them throughout the, the panel discussion as they make sense. But we will certainly leave time at the end to get to your questions as uh, they come up and as throughout the, our conversation. Um, again, today we are going to be discussing long-term care. Pretty broad topic, I know, um, and pretty uh, broad topic, even just in the sense of uh, the coronavirus pandemic and the aftershocks um, and as these facilities cover from the pandemic. Um, and so joining me today to talk about all this are our panelists, um, and I will have each of them introduce himself and tell us a little bit about the work that they do. Um, so let's start with Kim. Kim, can you introduce yourself? Thanks very much, Michaela. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm Kim Bergen-Jackson, and I'm the administrator at Oak Knoll Retirement Residence in Iowa City. Uh, we're a life plan, life care community, serving approximately 500 residents in all levels of care, um, we provide memory care as well as skilled care, end of life care, um, assisted living. We have a ton of fun. We like to focus on um, living, uh, living out your best life and, and aging the way you want to. So we focus a lot on choice. I'm also very involved with the University of Iowa adjunct faculty, and I'm thrilled to work with Dr. Buck. And I know Brenda, so it's like old home week on the panel. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, Leah, why don't you go next? 
Okay, my name is Dr. Leah Buck. I'm the Sally Mathis Hartwick Professor in Gerontological Nursing at the University of Iowa College of Nursing. And I'm also the director of the Barbara and Richard Somay Center for Gerontological Excellence at the University of Iowa. And really the mission of the center is to advance innovation in research, education, and practice to promote optimal aging for older adults uh, and their caregivers. And so we definitely are very interested in the long-term care space and how that intersects with our mission. Absolutely, Brenda, you're up next. Happy to be here as well. Um, so I am Brenda Earlbeck. I serve as the Vice President of Quality Improvement and Regulatory Affairs for Iowa Healthcare Association and Iowa Center for Assisted Living. Uh, we're the trade association that represents post-acute care um, in, in those two sectors, as well as home health. Um, from an advocacy standpoint, and we, we assist our members with, with compliance efforts and um, quality improvement efforts. So I'm a nurse by trade, spent most of my career as a director of nursing in a CCRC, much like Kim's. Um, so come to the table with some real world experience uh, from uh, since I just joined the association recently, um, last, well, April of 2021. So happy to be here. I'm very pleased that all of you could join us today to talk about this very important topic. Um, so to set the scene, um, I wanted to read a passage from a report that was recently published uh, that Dr. Beck uh, was kind enough to share with me um, by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. It states, the COVID-19 pandemic lifted the veil, revealing and amplifying long existing shortcomings in nursing home care, such as inadequate staffing levels, poor infection control, failures in oversight and regulation, and deficiencies that result in actual patient harm. The pandemic also highlighted nursing home residents' vulnerability and the pervasive ageism evident in undervaluing the lives of older adults. So really very serious issues that this report is laying out and is highlighted nationally, but I really wanted the panelists to take a moment to kind of explain how this is playing out in the state. What the res this report is saying is reflected in Iowa. Um, what challenges have we seen exacerbated in Iowa and how is it different or is it not different at all than what this report is laying out? You just want us to jump in whenever we... Uh, Please, just anyone can take this question. Well, I'll start if you don't mind. Um, so the, the um, NASE report, M and, and National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. I, I appreciated the report. I thought it was a very fair representation. And I would say that the long-term care system in this country has, has suffered from underfunding, which leads to less staffing, which leads to poorer quality. We know that if you don't have enough staff to take care of people uh, in long-term care, then you can't provide the quality of care that we all want to. And so staffing um, concerns have been escalated because it's been really hard to work in long-term care over the past 30 months, I will say. Um, Oakville's done very well, but I've been working in collaboration with a lot of other providers across the state providing COVID education through the ECHO program. We were able to talk with 135 nursing homes and uh, they struggled. Uh, we could not get PPE at the beginning. Uh, there was no, um, well, there wasn't a thought of a pandemic. So there are lots of providers that have double rooms. They're not built for, the spaces are not built for infection control. So COVID really provided us an opportunity to figure out how to make that work in a system that isn't going to go away. So people need care. We need to provide the best possible care we can and have all the resources available to us to make that happen. I'll just jump in next and, and highlight that Iowa as a state in relationship to the rest of the nation has always fared very well in terms of quality outcomes. Um, and so we can be very proud of that. And we've maintained that throughout the pandemic. And I think that's a real testament to the commitment um, made by the staff that continue to work in long-term care on a daily basis. Um, Kim kind of alluded to this, but the challenges that long-term care staff have faced throughout the pandemic are um, you know, really starting to wear on them and coming to work for a 12 hour shift, uh, wearing PPE and, and dealing with all of the changing protocols in regard to screening and visitation and, and testing and all of the requirements. It's, it's wearing them thin, but they continue to stand fairly steadfast. So we can, we can really give them a shout out 
Um, but and truly from from a um, 30,000 foot view, Iowa facilities have continued to fare fairly well. You know, and I would really um, add on to that and, and agree with what Kim and Brenda have highlighted here about the quality um, of the long-term care in Iowa. But I would also like to highlight, because I think both Brenda and Kim have been a little bit, um, I would say, Iowa nice about the fact that this has come at personal cost. In other words, for them, for both of them personally, as overseeing large facilities, that each staff person at personal cost has maintained the quality. But the, the question we really need to ask ourselves, you know, as Iowans is, can we continue to ask that of our healthcare workers in long-term care? And how long can they continue to do this realistically without us saying there needs to be system level changes so that that, that reputation and that quality can be maintained? I would, I, would, I would agree with both of those statements. I also want to remind everybody that um, during the first year when we really had no idea what we were doing, nursing homes across the country became the staff and the family members for residents who were living in long-term care. So assisted livings as well, who were very often left out of all of the rules and regulations and just sort of told to, you know, do whatever you'd like. Um, they, the staff, they worked long hours. They worked many days in a row. I know a lot of people who worked with COVID in the COVID outbreak areas. Um, they provided visitation, they did everything they could to keep the residents going. Um, you know, initially it, when it started out, we all thought it was just going to be a couple of weeks or a month, and then we would be back to, to normal. None of us, uh, looking back now anticipated that 30 months later, we'd still be talking about it. So there were underlying issues, reimbursement issues, uh, not a problem for a lot of CCRCs, but a problem for a lot of nursing homes. They serve clients who receive Medicaid dollars. This is a broken record that they don't receive enough money to meet the, the basic care needs. And so they have to find ways to supplement that. And so I really think it pulled the veil back on the reality that we're not paying attention to this group of people unless we have to. And they're actually dying, asking for help uh, to make the environments they live in better and, and um, stronger. So. I really think it's a national issue. We need to address that on and we need money for that. I'd kind of like to tag into what Kim just um, talked about that uh, I think sometimes the general public doesn't understand about the long-term care industry that we're, we're, we depend upon um, funding and reimbursement that come from primarily Medicare and Medicaid. Certainly there are some facilities that have some private pay folks, but those, those, that population is growing thinner and thinner by the day. And so as we rely on those um, sources of funding that do not change, um, but the overlying expenses have grown astro astronomically uh, throughout the pandemic, just not only just supplies, PPE and in truckloads and the cost of labor, um, has become really unsustainable for many long-term care facilities in the state because their, their income flow is not changing. And it certainly becomes a snowball effect from my understanding. These costs just keep rolling as the demand keeps increasing too. You know, and, and to, to highlight that at, you know, a, a level about payment models, even though I know that you know, Brenda has made a good point to the to the average taxpayer. We we don't think about these things, but so for because CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, are the primary payor, particularly for any lower income older adults. Um, they recently were um, getting ready to revise the requirements for long term care facilities um, to have mandatory minimum staffing levels. Now, as a nurse, and I think that, that Kim and Brenda would agree with me, the idea of mandatory um, minimum staffing levels is, is a good idea in concept, but without sufficient monies attached to that, it, it, it actually makes the problem worse. Mm -hmm. 
um, in that you now have an unfunded mandate that you must keep up with or you're out of compliance putting the rest of your financial uh, reserves into uh, risk. And in particular, where Iowa gets caught in a double bind is the idea that there are different rates for rural versus urban, um, and in particular for staffing there the, and the mix rates even, whereas traditionally the urban areas get more monies because the, the logic is that healthcare costs more in urban areas. But the reality is that it is more costly to deliver in rural areas, but they don't charge more because there's fewer providers, there's there's fewer staff, there's, you know, and and so for Iowa, the real challenge is making sure that there are fair payment rates um, so that these long-term care facilities can give the good care that they have been known for giving. And while we're talking about rural places, I would say that in my experience with the ECHO program, the majority of the rural providers that, that we had on the calls, um, 16 weeks for the initial curriculum and then 32 weeks after that, every week we met via Zoom to talk about COVID prevention strategies. And, and um, some of the discussion each week was around their isolation and their lack of support. So if you can imagine one of those small rural nursing homes with you know, a handful of staff going through this pandemic with outrageous numbers of COVID positivity across the nation, and they're all alone. Um, that was really scary for a lot of people. And, um, and, and Iowa Healthcare Association and Leading Age, which is the organization I'm a member of, um, also a trade association, was really, um, lifesavers. They were lifesavers during the pandemic. They, there were weekly Zoom calls. There was, the rules were changing every day, maybe by the minute. Um, Iowa Healthcare and Leading Age stayed on top of all of those changes and advised all of the long-term care providers across the state. So um, making up for the, the isolation that you feel when you're in a, a rural community. You know, I'm right here in the middle of downtown Iowa City, and I can jump over to Leah's office in about two minutes um, but it was still very isolating. Uh, so I, I don't think we've tapped into the impact COVID has had on the mental health um, of the people who live in long-term care and the people who work there uh, yet. I mean, I think that's an area that we'll get into as time goes on. Yeah, absolutely. I actually want to jump off that point. And, and I think this tags nicely with um, the point Leah made earlier that this came, the pandemic came at great personal cost to the employees within these facilities. You know, I, I heard anecdotally just what workers had to go through throughout the pandemics to the point that they're emerging with PTSD. And, and like you said, Kim, really kind of grappling with their mental and emotional health moving forward. So, you know, maybe not quite the, the retention part of it, but how can this industry even begin to help re these employees recover to the point where um, you know, they, they can continue to work in this industry, even though it's been, it's been quite an ordeal for them. I think it's really important that the message change from nursing homes are bad and people die there to the nursing homes thrived as best they could during the pandemic. People stepped up to the plate. They grew in leadership ways that they had no idea that they could. Uh, they were creative. Uh, overnight, our dining services department went from uh, you know, serving four restaurants essentially to doing all tray service when we shut down initially. Um, that's an incredible feat to, to, to overcome. So I, you know, I think we're trying to celebrate um, the successes that, that people have had, celebrate the silver linings that COVID brought. You know, what can we keep from COVID? Michaela, like we were talking earlier, these virtual panels are great and really um, came about during the pandemic because we couldn't get together. So what other things can we keep? The idea of private rooms providing more safety for infection control is a real thing. We have evidence now of 30 months of data that private rooms re reduce the risk of COVID uh, because you don't have a roommate. Um, so how can we look at helping long-term care facilities who've been around for 25 years, a lot of them family owned and operated and great in their tiny communities? How can we help them get to 
private rooms so that they can improve their infection control rates, things like that. Um, how, how can the general public help? You can reach out to your local nursing homes and you can ask if, if they need volunteers uh, to sit with residents, to do projects, arts and crafts, whatever you're really good at. Um, volunteer in your community nursing homes uh, to help, help take care of those older adults that live there. I'd kind of like to um, provide some of my own personal thought on how we can continue to support long-term care staff um, and, and protect their mental health um, and, and maybe return to a state of, of healthy uh, in a mental health perspective. But I think um, one of the things that we can do uh, to do that is to find ways to attract more people into the industry and into the long-term care workforce. What I see and what I hear from my members and, and what I experienced myself just a short time ago is this cyclical problem of people being burnt out because they're working so many hours. They have guilt because they're um, not maybe living up to their expectations outside of work. They're, they're physically tired, they're mentally tired, but there is no relief on the way because there is no person there um, to work that shift or to stay longer or to come in early. And so I think we need to look from a systemic perspective, how to make long-term care attractive again. Um, and I think one of those things is um, highlighting the good things um, because all too often, uh, long-term care folks, you know, read in the news or hear from, you know, someone at the grocery store uh, about a, a something bad that they heard happened or, or whatever. And, and that's really defeating to those folks that are continually come to work every day trying to do the best they can. So I think, um, you know, really the, the relief is somewhat in the numbers in getting folks back to back to the workforce. Yeah. And as you said about those stories you shared too, I imagine that doesn't bode well for recruitment, right? When you have students who are hearing these stories. Um, so what do you think would be a good step in strengthening that pipeline? You know, you talked a lot about changing the messaging, but are there other steps that maybe could be taken? You know, I, I heard the idea thrown around about changing certification processes or regulations. I don't know, like what, what are you guys thinking about in the industry and how to do that? Well, again, COVID's causing us to be creative, right? So we're, we're, we're in this situation where people don't wanna be here. What we need to do is introduce them to the residents who live in long-term care or like Oaknell, you know, independent living, assisted living in the health center. Um, that's why we're here. So looking at the differentiators of why, why do people work in long-term care? Nobody wants to live there. Nobody wants to work there. They get terrible press. Why, why do people do it? Almost 100% of the time, you talk about the relationships that are built over time. You know, I've been at Oaknell a very long time, over 20 years. I have, I have um, the privilege of working with second and third generation families who have been involved at Oaknell for over 30 years. I know everything about them, their families, uh, what their expectations are when they transition, if they need to transition to the health center. So it's how do we introduce new young people, how young, I don't know, but how do we introduce the idea that within these community walls, any community, um, there are amazing, incredible uh, older adults who are full of wisdom and sarcasm and um, hilarity and, and sadness. I mean, they're, they're people in long-term care that need somebody to care about them. And, and we need to speak of long-term care in a way that, um, shows that it is a specialty. It is an area of excellence. It is valued and important. I get emotional about it. I'm going to have to have Dr. Buck dog. Uh, but it matters. It matters. And every day you can make a difference in somebody's life just by going to work. Can, you can't say that about every job. So we just need that passion um, and sense of uh, responsibility to take care of people who took care of us when we needed it. I'm blathering. You guys talk. Kim, I think you absolutely um, hit the nail on the head 
and Brenda would probably agree with me as well, having taken, you know, I'm a nurse and having taken care of older adults, the bulk of my career, when I look at my own pictures from, you know, as a new nursing graduate, I look about 12 years old, I wore a ponytail and, um, but just always gravitated. I, I didn't have grandparents. Um, I was at the end of the family. They had died before I was born. And so caring for older adults, I found just kind of scratched an itch for me, but what I learned from them and just the, what they told me about life um, and history, you know, and, and things like that. I've taken care of Holocaust survivors. I've taken care of diplomats who were at key moments when like history changed. Um, I've taken care of veterans. Uh, across who have who have been, played a part on the on the large geopolitical, and as older adults, they have the wisdom and the time that they've kind of synthesized this story, and they tell it with such purpose and meaning that not only is your own life enriched by it, but you are also instructed on this is what it means to be human. And so we are trying at this point in time in the College of Nursing to really raise up the next generation of gerontological nurses. The, the University of Iowa College of Nursing has always been known across the country as a leader in gerontology or the study of older adults. And um, Kim and I, at this point in time, because she's correct, Oak Knoll is, you know, um, if, if both of us were a little bit more uh, active, we could walk back and forth. It is, it is that close. Sure. <laughs> um, and so we're really talking about how do we get our nursing students over into an active living community like that um, so that we get them to see at an early age that this is a viable um, career path, you know, for nurses. And so, um, you know, there, we are using the, you could say that the dark cloud of COVID we're, we're making the silver lining. And what that really is, is to say, we can't just ignore this workforce issue. Right. You know, we have to address it head on. We have to socialize nurses from the, the youngest age, that this is a viable career path. Um, but I would love to hear Kim talk a little bit about direct care workers, because we haven't exactly touched on that point yet. And they are really the major care providers in long-term care. Correct. Uh, we can't accomplish a mission. None of us can accomplish the mission without the direct care workforce. We, we're we need them desperately. And they, I love the residents that, that live here, but they have more intimate contact with them in a, you know, in a personal way. So the people with the closest relationships to the residents are the people that provide care in the most vulnerable way. You know, when, when you can't help yourself to the bathroom or you can't get in the shower, the person that's helping you provide that um, assistance with daily living is, is really your rock. It's the person that you rely on. And for us, that's our certified nursing assistants. And so how, how do you reach people to let them know this is a career path? This is a, this is a valid profession and you could be considered an expert. We don't talk naturally about um, experts in direct care, but that's exactly what they are. And, and so building them up to understand that they are um, a fully valid member of the team, that they have voice at the table, that they are speaking for the residents at times when they can't speak for themselves. And it's not just the direct care workforce. It's the, it's the rec aides, it's the dining staff, it's the housekeeping staff, it's the, all the frontline workers who have very close personal relationships with the residents. Those careers are meaningful. Um, they're hard. It's hard work. I'm not going to lie and say that it's not. It's hard. Um, physically challenging, uh, demanding. Uh, it can be stressful if you're working short staffed all the time because of the staffing problem. It's exhausting, but um, but very rewarding. The the most rewarding position I've ever had was as a CNA, but it was too hard for me, so I went and got my nursing degree. Um, and and you know I'm one step away as a nurse. I was one step away as an administrator. I just keep getting further away from the center, which is the residence. So. 
How, do we go to high schools? Do we go to junior highs? Do we go to churches? We're trying to think of all those creative ways to um, build up the, the workforce again. I want to um, share a thought that I had in regard to, to nurses. So apologize for going backwards and um, in thought, but one of the things I remember hearing when I was in nursing school was you don't want to work in a nursing home because you won't use your skills. And I think we need to re-educate folks on the truth of, behind that statement, that that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, the fact is nurses that work in long-term care settings have to be very autonomous and their skills have to be on point. They absolutely must be able to do a, a sound assessment and make a conclusion and call an on-call physician who's never seen this individual um, at 2 a.m. and help guide their decision to, to the right thing. And so, um, you know, we, we do IVs, we do all sorts of um, those tactical skills like they do in other settings. And I, I, I think sometimes nurses don't realize that they, they have that opportunity to use those, those technical skills in our setting too. Absolutely. I wanted to jump in here. Um, I think we, we have a question from the audience that, that may be pushing back a little bit on what you guys are saying uh, on the panel, but um, basically they ask, can you attract more frontline workers by telling them about making a difference? Um, and then he brings up about employees having basic financial needs, making livable wage benefits to those who work at universities and bigger employers um, to have adequate training, things like that. So what, what's your response to that? I, I agree with all of that. Um, but again, it goes back to the initial funding. So if you're, um, if you're um, running a facility, I hate that word, but I'm going to say it anyway. If you're running, if you're running a place and, and you have 100% or even 50% Medicaid, um, so lower income, older adults, you can't make the autonomous decision to push up the wages to compete with your neighbors or the hospital or whatever, uh, because you don't have the resources available to you, even to get to the break even point. So uh, I agree, uh, you know, tuition reimbursement, pushing people through school, if that's what they want to do, trade school, if that's what they want to do, scholarship programs, um, leadership opportunities, affordable benefits, a living wage. I 100% I agree with all of that. And also saying to those folks, you are valuable to the organization. We want your input. We want you to help drive whatever we're doing. You know, shared decision-making is a very empowering uh, product that I learned at the University of Iowa. So you, you get together as a group and you make decisions together that will best benefit the residents. And if you include the residents, in those decisions even better, you know, working as a true community. Um, but everybody has to believe that they have equal value on the team. And I'll tell you, I've worked with a lot of direct care workers who do not have a very high self-esteem or high value of themselves, or they've been mistreated by people in the past, uh, nurses or in administrator roles. And so we really have to look at the entire system and say, how can we, how can we value the people that we have and not consider them disposable um, and attract new people into the industry. Absolutely. So I just wanted to uh, pivot a little bit in, in the remaining time that we have. So um, Brenda, this question I might direct to you um, because it's, it's from the Iowa Healthcare Association. Um, I believe is your boss who recently announced recently that 11 nursing homes have closed in the state since December um, due to workforce issues like we've talked about here, but also financial issues um, and all the things that, that sort of come with that and that economic challenge we're facing. Um, but from my understanding, financial challenges are not uncommon for Iowa's nursing homes and long-term care facilities. So can you explain why that is and why um, whether Iowans should be concerned about more facilities closing in the near future? I think we've touched briefly on why this problem may exist, but I was hoping you could Tell us whether we should be worried about more closing. Well, I, I think there's a lot to that we don't know at this point in terms of anticipated closures. Um, you know, as facilities continue to struggle with this staffing crisis and they um, are continuing to have this, this exorbitant amount of expenditure related to, um, you know, labor and, and um, you know, PPE costs and all of those things, 
I think we probably can anticipate an, a few additional closures, which is unfortunate um, because I, you know, there there will be some access problems for for folks across the state that may have to travel to a town 20 or 30 or maybe more miles away um, to see their parent in a in a nursing facility or a, an assisted living. Um, so I, I really do believe that uh, the foundation uh, of these financial issues is the labor crisis, that there, you know, facilities are forced, I hate that word too, Kim, um, <laughs> nursing homes, um, programs, assisted living programs, they're, they um, are forced in some situations to, to seek contracted labor, which is, um, comes at a very much higher cost than than employing their own their own folks, and so I think until we can stabilize the workforce and and balance that out a little bit, we may anticipate some more of those closures. Yeah, certainly not good news, unfortunately. Um, and I think uh, maybe another aspect of that, obviously, like you said, labor is is really a key component here. But I wanted to circle back to a point that was brought up earlier about. Um, you know, these these action steps that are being called on by policymakers or the public moving forward and how that potentially could be detrimental to nursing homes and to long term care facilities. Um, I know the report calls for action um, in, in initiating fundamental change, but what are your concerns about that and what could that have a detrimental effect on nursing homes, you know, as they're grappling even with just day to day care that they're trying to provide. Yes, it could have a detrimental effect. I mean, there, there are so many people, there are only so many people in one organization, right? So we're, we're talking a lot about rural places, but even at Oaknall, there's only a certain number of people and um, you can only get a certain amount of work done. So it really feels like regulations are the answer to problems from the government side, like more regulations, more surveys, more fines, that, that isn't helping anybody improve their quality of care. So we really need to understand what is the systemic problem in nursing home A? Why is whatever's happening happening? Why do they keep having a COVID outbreak? What is the root cause of that? We need to teach people to think about root cause analysis and systemic changes. Um, instead of just finding some, you can find me uh, $10,000 a day if you want to. But if I don't really understand what the problem is and why I keep failing in whatever I'm failing at, I'm going to keep failing until I don't have any money left and then I have to close. So it's not really a system that's sustainable. Um, it gets a lot of press. It's very, um, very much everywhere when a nursing home gets itself into trouble. I, I'll never forget how that Kirkland, the Washington nursing home who had COVID first suffered through horrific press and that administrator stayed the course and did not leave. I don't know if I would have had the strength to do that. Um, <clears throat> and then they received like a $650,000 fine or something crazy like that. Um, they did the best they could with a virus that we had, none of us knew what we were dealing with. And so how can you find them for not knowing something and not acting appropriately when none of us knew? If, if it had hit the East Coast first and gone West, we, we would have seen the same exact thing on the East Coast because none of us knew what was happening. Uh, I remember the feeling of sort of flying out of control, trying to initiate programs and systems to keep code out. Um, but, and I asked people in the ECHO series to just remember it is a virus. So you, you can do all the right things every day for 30 months and something bad could still happen because it's a virus and it does what it wants and it changes and it mutates. So um, I don't, I don't think, I don't think all the extra regulation and all the severe fines people are receiving is the answer. It's quality improvement, continuous quality improvement and education. Don't you think? I would agree. And I think just to highlight what you said, Kim, you know, there's only so many people doing the work. Right. And when the, the, you know, an additional regulation is put into place, it, it doesn't change that. It doesn't change the amount of folks that you have. It doesn't change the amount of education and skills that they have um, to meet those requirements. It just adds additional burden. Um, so, and sometimes that's, you know, regulation is appropriate. We certainly yes. believe that. Um, but I think um, there are other ways to accomplish the quality improvement that's required or, you know, that we need to be looking for in long-term care. 
I, and I think if we addressed it, I'm sorry, Lee, I'll be quiet. Uh, if we if we assume positive intent, sort of a marker for me to just try and assume positive intent and then see where we could help. We, like the nation, help providers. Everybody wants to be five stars. Everybody wants to work with pride and intention and provide an, an excellent experience for the people that live in their in their buildings, everybody. I've never met anybody that works in long-term care that says, I like this job because I can suck. Do you know? Nobody says that. So um, I wish there was more of a coming together of the regulators and the, and, the, and the universities and the staff so that we could create systems of quality improvement that, that were successful. You know, and, and kind of just adding to that, because I, I think both Brenda and Kim have truly hit the nail on the head. But I always like to, um, you know, I, I guess I'm, a, I'm an ultimately hopeful person. So I always like to say that, you know, but this isn't where the story ends. It doesn't end in this kind of deficit model. But what it really, it ends is that COVID, like nothing else, has really highlighted where the issues are that need to change. And now that we know what needs to change, this is the time for people who care. And I'm not just saying in, in the healthcare profession itself, I know that we have many people on this call who have family members who perhaps are in long-term care or who are looking forward to a time when their family members may need long-term care to say that we as communities can also you know, come alongside these long-term care uh, facilities. Kim, earlier mentioned all the volunteer opportunities. And, um, you know, their community organizations can also be involved with helping out facilities, taking on different projects, you know, engaging. The ideal would be a model that's sort of like a, a long-term care without walls that, you know, the community is part of the long-term care and the long-term care facility is part of the community. And I think in doing that, there are more eyes on the issues who can both advocate on, on that kind of larger regulatory level, right? But who can also on a local level say, are there monies that a town government maybe has a little bit extra, you know, and are they being used for the care of older adults? But not only is it extra eyes on the problems, it's also extra hands uh, to help. So I would really encourage anybody listening to this recording, instead of saying what's wrong with long term care, to instead change the conversation to how can I be part of the solution? Exactly, that's so great, yeah. And you don't have to have a special skill set. You know, visiting with somebody uh, and having a cup of coffee is is just tremendous to someone who's feeling lonely. Um, it helps their day uh, just to have individual one on one. But there could be cooking. There could be you know maybe somebody plays an accordion or something. I've had an Elvis impersonator in here. There are lots. Of, I mean, whatever your thing is, I'm guaranteeing somebody would love to hear about it or talk about it. And believe it or not, those Elvis impersonators are very popular with very adults popular. because that's the music of their youth. Very popular. Yeah. I love that. All good solutions. Um, and very briefly, um, you know, I want to make a point to get to audience questions. We have some great questions that I really want to get to. But briefly, um, while we're waiting for the audience who hasn't asked their question yet to go ahead and put them in the Q&A box, um, what are other next steps that you would like to see? I know we've talked about quality improvement, labor, reimbursement. I, I imagine those are the big things. But any other next steps that you would like to see? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I, I like good press. So if places are planning to do, you know, things, uh, I often see like hundredth birthday celebrations or um, parties in general, but and there's a lot, every day there's a good story somewhere. We just don't take the time to let somebody know about it. So I would encourage long-term care families and staff uh, to think about 
you know, something cool that's going on in their space and let somebody know so that we can all hear about it. There is a lot of cool things going on and a lot of fun. I don't want everybody who's listening to think it's, you know, it, we're broke and, uh, and we can't have any fun. Um, there's a lot of fun to be had in long-term care and, and it really shouldn't be seen as a place that they go to die. It should be seen as a place where they are living their fullest capacity the way they want to. So if they want to do all the activities all day long, they do all the activities all day long. If they don't want to, and they want to sit in their room and have a, a bird feeder outside their window, they should have that. If, you know, it's, it's all about choice and what you want to do with the last 10 years of your life and, and us making that happen. So um, I would encourage you to, to get into your local nursing home and have a little fun and get to know some really great people. Absolutely. Okay, uh, questions from audience are starting to come in. So um, this one, I, I wanted to make a point to ask you, it's a little bit more on a serious note, but this audience member says, my dad is 85 and I, pro and I provide some in-home care to him. He's most likely at some point needing to go to assisted living or memory care. However, on Monday session of our in-depth week, um, panelists said that 51% of long-term care facilities are short staff versus the 39% in 2021. How can I even begin to feel comfortable having him receive care at one of these places? I'm grateful for healthcare for riders, but I'm concerned for residents at these facilities. I, I'll leave that to any panelists to take that. I think I can answer it. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Buck. Go ahead. Well, I would, I, what I was going to say, because I realized that, um, you know, for the, for the other two panelists, because they are in the industry, uh, you know, this might be a little bit trickier question, whereas I'm an outsider looking in. Um, and one of the, the pieces of information I often give a family is when they start to first consider um, thinking about long-term care and whatnot is I just, you know, I always try to link it to something they've done in the past that they've been successful at. And I have sort of say to them along the ideas, you know, if you picked out childcare for your children, if you picked out schools, you know, as your kids age, as you, as you have already worked with family members to find their best next position, this is the exact same skill set. You know, we're talking here in generalities and not in specifics. And I would really recommend, you know, for family members as they start to think about this, that they really visit, um, you know, facilities in their area that they, um, because each one has its, if you've seen one term, one long-term care, you've seen one long-term care, each has their own little difference or whatever. And just look for that one that best matches. Um, and I, I think to do that, as opposed to kind of take this global and say, well, they're all understaffed, I'm concerned. And, um, and we've heard today that those of us, you know, in the business are concerned about that as well. But boots on the ground, you know, the facilities themselves are doing good work. And so just visit and get a feel for, you know, the ones in your area and your own comfort level and what's best for your loved one. I would add that you can ask them, what, what are they doing about it? So yes, staffing is probably a problem in a lot of places, but what are they doing about it? Are they, um, you know, what, what are their solutions to make the staffing crisis better? People should be able to talk to you about how they're trying to make things better. Uh, if they go, I don't know, then that's probably not the place for you because they really need to be actively engaged in thinking outside the box. That's what COVID has provided us is, is, a, is a way to become experts in creative thinking and, um, and innovation. And so I'd be glad to talk to anybody um, just about you know being creative. Brenda, you were gonna talk first, so I'll be quiet now. Well, I think both of you said exactly what I was thinking. And I just, I think, um, many of the long-term care facilities in our state have done a fantastic job. And I, I said that if, at the beginning of the call, and I'll say it again, many of them have weathered the storm fantastically, um, likely due to leadership that has been there for a very long time, um, or, you know, some, some really cohesive teamwork. Um, so many of them continue to do a very good job uh, managing this, you know, some of the challenges they've, they've been faced with, including the, the workforce shortage. 
And I would agree, there are some really creative um, ideas that they have come up with to continue to provide quality of care with uh, maybe fewer or maybe the same number of, of folks on board. So I would, I would um, definitely mirror what Dr. Buck said about just visiting and getting a feel. Absolutely. So another question we have, um, I think um, it's part of next steps moving forward. Um, this person asks, is part of improving quality and long-term care facilities changing what we pay for? Should government start to pay for the quality of care provided rather than the amount of services provided? Would quality pr improve if facilities were paid for producing it? So I can respond to that. Um, that's already occurring. Um, there are several quality measures for which nursing facilities across the nation um, are um, uh, measured, I guess, uh, against standards or benchmarks, and, and the reimbursement is tied directly to that. Um, so certain measures like rehospitalizations and, and short-term skilled uh, outcomes in regard to um, improvement that a person may have experienced while they were in, uh, in a nursing facility. So there are already models that are built upon those, those quality outcomes. Certainly there's opportunity for more. Um, what I fear might happen is that we'll bridge, we'll, we'll make the gap even wider um, in that the folks that are doing well will get more money to continue to do well where some of the folks that are struggling uh, will get left behind. Um, and maybe we need to focus a little bit more on making sure that we're, we're helping them uh, bridge the gap and, and get where they need to go. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, we have a couple of questions that I'm going to pair together because I think they kind of get at the same thing around this idea about creating a pipeline and, and getting students interested in working for nursing homes. Um, one person asked about the Candy Striper program. She used to be a Candy Striper in the 70s. What happened to this program for high school students? Um, another person asked about nurses and whether they are required to do a rotation in nursing homes. And if not, why not? Would this be a good way to introduce high school students, nursing students to this field? I can take that one since I'm sitting in the University of Iowa College of Nursing and say, yes, we are. Uh, our students do have a um, rotation in um, nursing homes. And as a matter of fact, the University of Iowa College of Nursing is one, is one of the few colleges of nursing in the country that require a um, gerontology course for our undergraduate students. Many offer it as an elective, but it's required in Iowa because of just its expertise on the national level related to that. And, um, you know, the, the person who put the question in is absolutely right that we find once the students are in the care environment, they begin to see, as Brenda said earlier, that skills are used, nursing skills are used, valuable ones. And, you know, as Kim has also highlighted that, and it's also a great deal of fun. Mm -hmm. I personally like to be in a facility when they are bringing in the animals. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's therapy dogs coming through, sometimes it's a facility cat. Um, I one time was case managing hospice patients in a long-term care facility where the cat lived on the second floor in the activity director's office, um, but liked to hang out in the front uh, you know, area so that the cat could keep an eye on everybody coming and going. And when it needed to use the cat facilities, in other words, its litter box was upstairs, it would go stand by the elevator and meow until somebody pressed the elevator and sent the cat up. Um, those are, that doesn't happen in a hospital. Uh -huh. You know, that's, that's the wonderful part of uh, practicing and being part of a long-term care facility. I love the idea of bringing back the candy stripers. I don't, know if I know anything about that program or why it went away, but um, Oaknell is wide open to all students. Um, we have nurses here, we have rec therapists here, uh, all kinds of students. That's the way to go. I I'm just trying to decide if I want to talk to middle school people about uh, older adults or if I wanna wait to high school. I've talked at high schools before and it looks a lot like this. 
<laughs> but I'm sure my words are getting in. Everybody's looking at their phone. Nobody's really interested. If, if you remember high school, you didn't want to listen to the speakers either. So I'm still trying to figure out a way to make it exciting. Um, all I really need to do is get them in the door. And once they meet the residents, you're either hooked or you're not hooked. So I've recently started taking residents with me to speak to student groups. Uh, and we just spoke at the College of Pharmacy in their palliative care certificate program. And I brought a resident with me who's 96 years old. And she was a big, a, a big delight to the students. They just lit up when she was talking. So engaging our residents to help us uh, recruit and inform the public is a great idea if they're if they like the idea. Um, I'll always take a partner with me now when I go out. Absolutely. Well, great. Well, I think um, we are at time, and these are really all the audience questions that I see that we can answer today. So, wanted to thank the panelists first off for being so enlightening and um, you know sharing their wonderful insights on this this heavy topic, obviously. But um, I, I feel like it was a good conversation. So, thank you, and thank you to the audience for joining us today. Hopefully, we will see you tomorrow for our next in-depth session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah.